biological systems are remarkable in their complexity. Humans have long pursued patterns in the living world, both out of sheer fascination and for utility. So these patterns have gone on to inspire innumerable structures, tools and machines that have all found their place in the human civilization. In our long-standing endeavor to understand life, we're yet to have an answer to this question. Now, we may be very far from understanding exactly what life is, but we have managed to identify attributes of life. The ability to interact with and respond to the environment is a characteristic of life. It is what makes the cell a living entity. And here is where it gets really interesting because here we have something that is imperceptible to the naked eye. Yet it is what forms the very basis of the entire living world. From the humble bumblebee to the soil bacteria, from the giant trees to the tiny little plants, you and I, we all share this fundamental of life. And we may all think we're very different. But the cell here is a reminder that really we're all the same. And going from an organelle to a cell, uh, from a cell to an organism, from an organism to a community may seem like a very daunting task. It in fact adds layers of complexity to the study of life. Uh, that is perhaps why classrooms are quick to adopt the reductionist approach of denoting the cell as a sum of its parts, the organelles. But the devil lies in the details. The simple knowledge of the various components of a machine does not quite reveal just how the machine works. Similarly, it is impossible for us to realize exactly how the cell is able to interact with the environment despite knowing the individual function of every organelle. I like to imagine of each organelle as a camp uh, with a distinct task force uh, all trained to together accomplish a mission at hand. And uh, these camps are joined by or connected by highways. Uh, these highways are then bustling with uh, molecular mail vans and cargo trucks. The, these highways essentially enable communication between the different camps, allowing them to coordinate and launch a response or, you know, an attack. So uh, by the virtue of being a larger size, the camps themselves are far more visible from outer space than the letters that they exchange. So we have in fact had to rely on technological advancements to properly understand signaling circuits inside the cell. And this is exactly why molecular biology is in fact one of the youngest fields of life science. Concerted efforts from scientists have helped us discover uh, various fast, uh, scary looking network of signaling events in the cell. And what makes them scary is that you just don't know where to begin. All right, I'm a little sorry for springing that up on you. Uh, I just had to make my point. They are scary looking, right? Uh, you, you may imagine that if just reading this, if just reading a pathway is so hard, it must take the work of a genius to actually discover it. Well, in reality, it's more like solving a jigsaw puzzle, uh, and there's even a guide on how to go about it. Typically, scientists begin by mapping a pathway to a phenotype that it produces. Uh, in this way, they're able to establish the significance of a pathway. Some pathways may be involved in simply maintaining a healthy intracellular environment, while the others may be involved in, say, generating a response to an extracellular cue, for example. These efforts are then followed by efforts to, you know, further understand the finer details of a pathway. This is what is called pathway delineation, wherein you're able to lay down the sequence of molecular interactions that ultimately result in a phenotype. Now, um, scientists have managed to come up with a framework for uh, pathway delineation that is based on some conserved signaling events that occur across all pathways. And this is kind of like the holy grail of signaling. This is what it looks like. Looking at that, everything feels visible. But 
Is it also flawless? Where are the blind spots hiding? Let's dive in. All right, let's just cut to the chase. The holy grail, not as neat as it sounds. Two seemingly linear pathways may interact with each other to produce a third phenotype. This is called signaling crosstalk. And the pace at which we establish crosstalk between two signaling pathways is limited by the pace at which we independently establish the two pathways. So, in the past we've made some quick progress, sure, but it's all been in serendipitous jolts. There's no concrete approach to rely on. So that's one down. Let's move on to the second blind spot. All right, here's the deal. Cells sometimes suffer from mutations. While some of these mutations may be lethal, but the cell manages to survive most of them, all thanks to its arsenal of the two wars, redundancy and remodeling. Well, let's break that down. Certain signaling events are vital to ensure the survival of the organism. The cells really cannot afford a defect there. And luckily, they don't have to. That's because most signaling highways are multi-lane. What does that mean? Well, if one lane must shut down, traffic can simply be rerouted to other lanes. In this way, signaling redundancies ensure the functionality of an inoperative pathway is conserved. But these redundancies may not come to light if we study pathway delineation in healthy cells exclusively. However, they're still far easier to spot than remodeling. For instance, let's talk about cancer cells. Now in cancer cells, they're riddled with mutations and as a result, they exhibit highly abnormal behavior. You do tend to act odd when there are, you know, closing down of pathways and propping up of newer highways. It's, 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 it's a messy internal environment. Thus, we, it, is, it is our responsibility to ensure that when we are studying a particular pathway, we account not only for the wild type pattern of signaling, but also for the rewired interactions that are prompted by changes in the intracellular environment. This brings me to blind spot number three. It's only befitting that we talk about the extracellular environment right after we talk about the intracellular environment. Uh, but the distinct environmental cues draw unique responses from the cell, all coordinated by a cascade of signaling events. So, do we really know everything about something? I doubt it. Let's talk about the next blind spot. Okay, this blind spot is a bit more exciting because the world is doing something about it. You remember when I said that we're all the same? Uh, well, yeah, we're all the same, but we're also all different, right? Despite establishing how a system may respond to an extracellular cue, it is unreasonable to expect every individual to respond identically to it. Genetic and epigenetic heterogeneity inherent in populations is the reason why you and I may respond very differently to the very same drug. This is in fact the premise for precision medicine. Now we can soon expect drugs to be tailor-made for our unique DNA identities. And um, speaking of DNA, this brings me to the fifth and final blind spot. Our DNA is quite obviously different from that of model organisms used in biology. A typical delineation effort is carried out in cell lines, and these findings are then validated in model organisms like rodents or primates or even worms sometimes. The problem here is that none of these systems are identical to humans. So the human reality may diverge from the molecular identities and interactions established in these model organisms. I hope that over the course of this talk, it has become apparent how blind spots are nothing but system artifacts. In the past, biology has evolved its methods to adopt technological aid and to birth concepts with greater accuracy and resolution. And it continues to do so beautifully. 
by building up on our knowledge we can hope to emerge on the brighter side of biology thank you